especially for those permanently shut down plants. Uh, then John McCurgan, who is our Chief for the Storage and Transportation Licensing Branch, will discuss potential regulatory relief pathways. Um, lastly, we're going to open it up for the industry to provide feedback and discuss the type of relief that they're anticipating. Uh, and then the last part of our agenda around 950, we'll open the phone lines for the public to um, ask questions and provide I do want to just um, to thank a couple people for Kelly Jamerson for running the WebEx and Sarah Lopez, who I mentioned is our meeting facilitator. Thank you. Uh, with that, I just want to thank you again for your participation today um, and support of this public engagement. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Lopez um, to begin the formal portion of the meeting. Okay. Hi, Andrea. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah. I'll be facilitating today's meeting. So let me just cover the logistics quickly before we really get started. As our operator Karen noted, everybody's in listen-only mode until we get to the public comment portion of today's meeting, which um, this is a Category 2 meeting, so that means it's going to happen after we finish the business portion of the meeting, so after, we, um, after industry gets a chance to ask their questions and comments. Uh, if you are on the WebEx right now, that's great. You should be seeing our meeting logistics slide on your screen. If you're not on the WebEx and you still want to access our slides, um, you can find them online. So you can find them on the NRC public meeting notice for today's meeting. If you, if you can find that public meeting notice just by Googling NRC public meetings, and, and the, the, um, that website should be the first search result. If you find this meeting, there's a link to our slides. And if you're familiar with using our Adam system, the extension, the accession number is ML201. 26G244. Again, that's ML20126 G244. Um, so I want to ask the NRC folks that are on the leader line to please mute yourself if you're not speaking, just a reminder. Um, and then also for the NRC folks, when we do get to the question and answer part, just remember to um, please um, introduce yourself so everybody knows who's talking. So when we do get to the public comment portion of the meeting for the attendees on the line, all you're going to need to do is press star 1 on your phone and follow the operator prompts, and Karen will know to open up your phone line to speak. Um, just double check that you haven't muted your own phone, because um, that obviously is a problem. So just unmute yourself when you press star 1. Uh, if you're in the WebEx, you can also send us a question or comment using the chat function. So. Um, the chat function is the little blue kind of speaker bubble icon, speaking bubble icon at the bottom of your WebEx screen. If you don't see that, um, a list of icons across the bottom of your WebEx screen, just kind of click on WebEx, like click on the slides, and those icons should pop up. So if you just click on that blue, blue bubble, the um, chat panel will open up on the right side of your screen. And I'll be monitoring that. You'll be sending your messages to, um, I believe it's all panelists, and I'll be monitoring that, and I'll be reading your questions or comments aloud um, during the public comment, public comment portion of the meeting. And I also want to note um, that you may want to open up that chat function because I'll be posting various links that are referenced in the slides today, so you can have easy access to those links, and you can just click on them. So I'll be doing that in a little bit. Um, and as you're probably aware, the NRC is operating in a maximum telework status, and we're all working remotely. We're all individually calling into this meeting. Um, it definitely presents its own challenges, right, in terms of um, uh, quality of all of our cell phones and, and being able to coordinate from afar. Uh, but we're doing our best. And if you do have any feedback, I'll be sharing my email address because um, I'm facilitating uh, a good amount of these meetings, and I'm interested if you have any feedback or suggestions if you're a, if you're a virtual meeting expert. Um, I want to remind everybody that today's meeting is focused solely on the relief requests and other COVID-related regulatory topics for NRC ICTC licensees. So if you have more general questions about the NRC's overall COVID response or any other questions related to other types of NRC licensees or other topics, um, you, we're, we do have our... Um, Public Affairs Officer Dave McIntyre on the line, and I'm going to be providing his email um, in the chat in just a minute, but um, his email is david.mcintyre at nrc.gov, and you spell his last name M-C-I-N-T-Y-R-E. Um, opa.resource at nrc.gov is also a good email to share uh, um, if you have questions as well. So I'll be 
probably sharing those in the WebEx as well. Um, today's call is an information sharing and information gathering dialogue only. And as always for our public meetings, the NRC public meetings, no regulatory decisions will be made. I would reinforce that none of the information provided in today's meeting should be taken by, to be a request by a licensee or a decision by the NRC. And this is an open interaction, a public interaction, so as such, we will not be discussing any proprietary or sensitive information. Um, and just a final note before I hand it over uh, to get started, we are not transcribing or otherwise recording today's meeting. However, we, um, the NRC staff will be putting together a meeting summary of today's meeting, and that will be posted um, you know, somewhere online, and, and, and I'm sure our folks will let you know where that will be. So with that, I'll move it to our next slide, if you could do that, Kelly. And I will introduce um, Mike Callahan, who is going to speak on behalf of the Decommissioning Plant Coalition. Mike? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate today on behalf of the Decommissioning Plant Coalition, and especially for the chance to express our great appreciation for the hard work and long hours devoted by the NRC staff to identify and prepare for COVID-19 impact. I also want to recognize the members of the permanently shut down plant community and NEI who have contributed many staff hours uh, to this effort. Uh, our first task was to communicate among each other and to identify and then inventory the potential impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated protection guidelines and state orders might present. Um, for those situations, we then identified specific target dates that impacts would arrive. We anticipated when regulatory compliance challenges would require potential interaction with the NRC. None have been needed so far. We next focused on identifying potential actions that would expand the pool of available staff to accomplish required activities. We also identified ways in which certain activities and training requirements could be accomplished or could be deferred. One such example of that is should become pretty obvious. It's, it's the issue of annual physicals that are required for certain personnel. And the reason that's an issue is that so many doctors are unable to uh, leave their emergency duties or to open their offices for those physicals. So I'll talk a little bit more about this issue on uh, this matter on um, uh, best practice uh, about best practices in a little bit. Four of our DPC members work to develop draft sample requests for relief from certain qualification requirements and physical requirements. They've been developed as general samples for adaption and use at all of our sites as appropriate. These requests will, in most cases, describe the alternate measures that we have taken or will propose to take rather than to, ex rather than to ask for a complete exemption from a, a particular requirement. We believe that for its part, the NRC has developed a regulatory process that it will discuss today, um, and we think those samples will dovetail nicely with that process use of those samples converted to actual requests will dovetail nicely. Perhaps the most valuable aspect of our recent activities is the interaction between our sites and the expanded knowledge of the available tools and practices that sites are employing or may employ yet during this national emergency. Our whole focus has been geared toward sticking to regular order, that is, maintaining our staff, maintaining our qualifications, rather than um, looking for how, looking for uh, uh, the worst that can happen. We continue to share and develop these best practices that are directed at preserving the health and safety of the staff, maintaining staffing levels, and enhancing contingency planning. 
one such example of that uh, is uh, the ability to make use of tele-appointments with medical personnel to get as much of an of a uh, physical done as possible. And while none of the staff so far have are in are in violation of any NRC requirement or outside the parameters of any NRC requirement, that's one tool that has been that is available to us to be as uh, observant and as cautious as we possibly can. Another best practice is a task analysis that one uh, one uh, site provided to us. They have the, their their each staff member perform task analysis for each potential vector of the transmission of the disease. They look at all the common equipment, all the touch, all the gear handoffs, all the turnover practices, all the meeting spaces, shared vehicles and determine whether or not they're disinfecting them and following CDC guidelines in, in, in terms of preventing the spread. And then after they do that analysis, they do it again and again, and they keep learning. It's peer-to-peer -peer learning, and the mindset is that, each sta that the staff protects each other from getting sick. There are other examples of, for example, providing meals including enough to take home to avoid staff having to make additional stops and, and, a, and a variety of others. We'll continue to build that uh, and share it with each other. But the entire effort is dedicated toward preserving the staff, the staffing levels, and, and maintaining the safe and healthy and secure workplace during this challenging period. Um, with that, I can turn it back to you, Sarah, or send it right on over to Bruce. Yeah, we can just go right over to Bruce. Can we uh, go to the next slide and, and hear from Bruce Montgomery from the Nuclear Energy Institute, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. I oh. appreciate it. Uh, yep. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my name is Bruce Montgomery with the Nuclear Energy Institute. I'm the director of uh, used fuel and decommissioning. We're pleased to have the opportunity to address measures by the industry and NRC to cope with this ongoing pandemic. We greatly appreciate NRC's leadership in reaching out very early on to our community to understand the challenges we're facing. But I'd just like to, to make some high-level comments to sort of wrap around the specifics that Mike has just provided. But first, NEI represents over 300 companies, universities, and individuals engaged in all aspects of the nuclear industry including facilities storing used nuclear fuel at fixed sites or are conducting decommissioning activities that shut down plants across the U.S. Uh, this pandemic presents many challenges um, met by the kind of innovation and cooperation that we've always come to enjoy in our industry and that is keeping our workers healthy and is assuring the continued safety and security of the public. Uh, we have been conducting weekly calls with America's operating reactor fleet fuel cycle facilities, uh, materials licensees, universities with test reactors, and of course operators of independent spent fuel storage facilities and decommissioning sites. Our objective is to share approaches to dealing with the pandemic, keeping our workers safe and healthy, while ensuring operations can continue in a manner that is in a public interest with safety and security of our employees and the public our foremost goal. We are pleased to team with the Decommissioning Plant Coalition to address the specific needs of the community of shutdown plants to ensure that we understand the challenges of maintaining operations at these facilities and to prepare in advance for the potential need to modify regulatory requirements in a way that ensures the health and safety of the public is continually assured, regardless of the pandemic. The licensing approaches that uh, Mike has discussed and have been developed and shared uh, with the industry are intended to be used if and when needed to seek temporary relief from very specific regulatory requirements that may have become temporarily impractical. Examples include such things as annual physical exams where medical facilities are temporarily unavailable or recurring training that might involve travel to and from the community surrounding the facility, thus increasing the risk of spreading infection. The nuclear industry has taken extraordinary measures during this pandemic to protect its workers from COVID-19, 
and thereby preventing the spread of the virus to our communities while we continue operation. This has been, to date, a great success, highlighted by the sharing, innovation, and dedication and professionalism of our workers. Again, we appreciate NRC's early recognition of the impact of the pandemic that might have on the operation of these facilities and the advanced efforts NRC has taken to prepare for the need for targeted and temporary relief from the specific requirements such as those discussed by Mike. Thank you. This concludes my remarks. Back to you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Kelly, can we go to the next slide, please? So the next presentation is going to be the NRC's presentation, and we'll be hearing from John McCurgan, who's Chief of the Storage and Transportation Licensing Branch, and he's going to speak on the available regulatory relief pathways. John? Great. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, maybe we can go to the next slide, please. So again, thanks. You know, as Andrea mentioned, the NRC has been taking prudent actions to prepare to respond to any emergent needs for the, from the industry. Uh, the NRC has been maintaining a steady dialogue with the licensees, as you just heard, to maintain our situational awareness of the conditions at the site. So as chief of the licensing branch, one of my priorities has been to ensure that we would be able to respond quickly to review and appropriately come to safety conclusions on any urgently needed licensing action. Through the periodic teleconferences we've been having, we've gotten some valuable insights with the, on the conditions in the field and we've heard some of the dialogue that's going on amongst the industry, and that's really enabled us to prepare better for any emergent challenges. I want to thank the industry, especially NEI and the DPC, for their efforts in assisting in that dialogue and coordinating those discussions. I'm pleased to say that thus far there have been very few needs for uh, relief, and this is an area where we'd be happy if, if uh, our preparations went unused. That would be uh, ideal. But we are prepared should any emergent uh, needs uh, come to bear. Another point I'd like to stress you know, before diving into the details is the emphasis uh, to the extent possible, we'd like to maintain our regular processes. And what I mean by that is that we'd like to use our established processes to the greatest extent possible. And where licensing actions are foreseeable, we'd ask the industry to bring those forward in a timely way so that we can prepare and process them as we normally would, albeit in these circumstances we would want to move expeditiously. Uh, in order to ensure safety. But recognizing that this public health emergency could create very rapidly emerging needs, the NRC has sought to proactively communicate to industry the regulatory options available for industry to seek relief, and most importantly, to communicate the expectation that licensees continue to ensure safety and security even in these difficult times. So to that end, back on April 7th, uh, 2020, the NRC issued a letter to all NRC material licenses about everybody except the operating reactors and the research and test reactors who received a separate communication. But that letter outlined the regulatory options for licensees to seek relief that may be necessary during the COVID-19 public health emergency. So this letter discusses three options to seek different kinds of regulatory relief while maintaining safety. The first option is for licensees to seek an exemption to regulations or amendments for license conditions that would include requirements imposed by order, and we'll discuss more of the options on how to achieve the, those different kinds of relief in the next slide. The section, second option is that the NRC has the ability to issue enforcement guidance memoranda, authorizing inspectors to use discretion to not cite certain violations of requirements when specified criteria are met, and the staff will evaluate the need for enforcement discretion based on the issues raised by licensees. The agency has issued an EGM, an Enforcement Guidance Memo, uh, and we are currently working on another attachment uh, focused on the SSC and fuel cycle licensees. And so this will be coming forward uh, soon, and we will make that uh, uh, available, uh, publicly available. And we'll discuss uh, this EGM guidance uh, more in a little bit. And so finally, the third option is to discuss immediate relief. And if immediate relief is needed, SSC licensees should contact the appropriate licensing point of contact. And this option is only to address the unanticipated temporary situations uh, for potential non-compliance. Next slide, please. So exemptions should be rare and should only be sought when other, all other means of compliance have been exhausted. So exemptions to the regulations that may be necessary during the COVID-19 public health emergency are expected to be temporary and will have an expiration date. Licensees 
agencies are expected to be compliance with regulations or commitments from which relief was granted prior to the expiration of the exemption. And we would like to emphasize that an exemption will be granted only if the NRC determines that it is authorized by law, will not endanger life or property or the common defense and security, and is otherwise in the public interest. So the protection of public health and safety, common defense and security, and the environment is still our standard in reviewing these exemption requests. We've heard from some licensees that depending on the circumstances, it may take some time to come back into compliance. And as mentioned earlier, these exemptions should be temporary, and if a licensee needs additional time beyond that granted in the initial exemption, the NRC would consider that on a subsequent request that updated all of the pertinent information in the initial request. Next slide, please. Right, thank you. Yep. Um, so if necessary, licensees may request immediate exemption via email or phone in emergent situations, and these should be very rare. The exemption request must still contain all of the necessary information for an exemption, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later but a verbal request must be followed up within 24 hours by written documentation. And the follow-up written documentation must confirm the information submitted verbally and upon which the NRC specifically relied when granting the exemption. And there's a phone number there provided. But we do anticipate that these would be extremely rare and our dialogues and conversations with the licensees and any anticipatory action needs will help eliminate the need for any uh, emergent requests like this. Next slide, please. So in most cases, we would like to, we'd like you to talk with your licensing point of contact about any upcoming issues. If you're doing that, please continue to do so. But in addition to contacting the licensing POC via phone and email, licensees can also use the online relief request submission form at the link on the slide here especially if you don't happen to know your POC or POC is, is unavailable for some reason, this would be a great starting point. Once you submit the online form here, the appropriate NRC staff member will contact you for more information. I do want to note that this form is not approved for the transmission of safeguards or classified information, and it should not be used for relief requests related to Part 73, which is our physical protection of uh, plants and materials. So based on the information from industry, the staff is prepared to quickly process certain types of relief requests. NRC is continually reviewing information received from the ISSC licensees and the industry on the impact from the COVID-19 emergency to prepare for anticipated requests. It is expected that some licensees may need additional exemptions beyond what the NRC staff has currently envisioned, and these requests may take more time to process. Thus, we continue to urge early communication to enable the staff to prepare appropriately. We encourage you to discuss potential relief requests with your POC in advance, similar to pre-application meetings for other kinds of licensing action. And so this is a, uh, a habit that uh, a lot of the licensees are familiar with, and we continue to encourage uh, those kinds of interactions. Next slide, please. So when licensees submit relief requests, uh, make sure to include sufficient information for the staff's review and decision. We ask that you uh, indicate how the COVID-19 public health emergency prevented you from performing certain required activities. Identify the specific regulatory requirements that you need relief from. They could be regulations, license conditions, license commitments, or an order. And provide the specific citation in the regulations or your license commitment, such as your QA plan or your physical security plan. This will help the staff to find the information during the review. The licensee should provide a summary of actions taken to prevent the use of an exemption, i.g. ship changes or off-ship personnel staged at a number of location. And these are some of the best practices that we would encourage the industry to share amongst themselves to try to avoid the need for exemptions that should be of the last resort. And finally, uh, we'd ask that you describe the activities that might not be performed or might need to be performed differently and how the COVID-19 public health emergency has prevented the ability to carry out these activities. Next slide, please. So to continue on the information to be included in the relief request, uh, certainly a discussion of the compensatory measures or contingency plans that the licensee has taken during the time of noncompliance. Tell us the date and time
time when the non-compliance will start so that we know how urgently the request is needed. We'd appreciate a two-week uh, time frame that would be ideal for us to process those requests. We do understand that the situations may change rapidly, but again, to the extent that we can, early communication will be very beneficial. As I mentioned, the relief should be temporary. You should have a schedule on how and when you would come back into compliance. And you should also track the status of the non-compliance as applicable. Uh, finally, if categorical exclusion is, is necessary from environmental reviews and if it is applicable, an explanation as to why that request satisfies the criteria for a categorical exclusion from environmental reviews should be provided. Next slide, please. Let me take a minute to talk about enforcement discretion. So the NRC has issued an enforcement guidance memoranda and provides guidance to the inspection staff for disposition of violations during the COVID-19 public health emergency. The NRC is issuing this guidance concerning the process for exercising enforcement discretion in certain situations where NRC licensees encounter compliance issues caused by COVID-19 related impacts. It is intended to provide a mechanism for ensuring continued safe and secure operation of the NRC regulated activities during the public health emergency. And the NRC believes that such flexibility will also minimize regulatory impacts licensees may experience. While the NRC continues to provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection of public health and safety, we we'll to common defense and security and protect the environment. So the uh, EGM that we issued, the Enforcement Guidance Memorandum, had an attachment that focused on security, personnel, training, and requalification as required under Part 73, Appendix B, Section and, and that covered uh, the nuclear power plants and the generally licensed FCCs, the, those FCCs associated with the power plant that have a general license. We're now in the process of developing an attachment that focuses on Part 73, Appendix B, Sections 1 through 5. And this attachment would cover the specific licensed FCCs. This attachment will discuss certain annual requalification requirements, such as physical exams and weapons training, uh, that due to social distancing or other restrictions may be difficult or impossible to perform. As I mentioned earlier, the NRC believe that, believes that such discretion would minimize regulatory impacts on licensees, while the NRC continues to provide reasonable assurance for adequate protection of public health and safety. Next slide, please. So at that time, at this time, I'd like to check back in with Mike Callahan and Bruce Montgomery to see if they have any questions on, on what I've discussed thus far. And so Bruce and or Mike, well, maybe I'll start with um, uh, Bruce and then go to Mike. Yeah, thank you, John. That's a great presentation. I think uh, listening uh, to your discussion and reading through your slides, uh, I think it sort of reinforces the approach that uh, we see as appropriate for our side, which by and large is to follow regular order for the licensing relief requests. Uh, so that, I think that's the, 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 the plan we'll follow going forward. You, you talk about enforcement discretion. I think... Um, you know, just uh, to let you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussions over the past few weeks on the industry side, and we don't really uh, see an immediate need to uh, take advantage of the, of the plans you've put in place for enforcement discretion, but uh, thank you very much for giving that some consideration. I think a lot of the things that we uh, foresee uh, that we will need, uh, we'll have time in advance to process uh, these relief requests, So, uh, but it's good to have... Uh, uh, this opportunity to invoke that if, if, if something comes up on a very emergent basis. Um, I think uh, just to let you know uh, from the discussions we have had, and I think some of these you're aware of, that uh, you can expect to receive some of these submittals starting uh, next week or two. Uh, so, And they'll be very targeted, very specific for some of the very uh, um, specific needs uh, that, we, that we've discussed in Mike's uh, discussion a few minutes ago. So that's all I had, Mike. Uh, I'll punt it over to you. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks, John. Uh, I agree that uh, uh, that's an excellent presentation, John. And as I said earlier, I think that the work that we have done, and, and Bruce and NEI have done, uh, dovetails nicely with um, the amount of with, with how you envision moving forward. Uh, again, this has been a labor-intensive effort on, I think, your part, and I know it has been on our part, to anticipate what and when we might need and how best to continue this to, and how best to anticipate issues 
that we can take action to ensure proper staffing. So I think uh, the, the work we put into it reflects a very coherent process to ensuring the continued health and safety of the workforce and the health and safety of the uh, public. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike and Bruce. I would. I would mention that uh, we do have, in addition to our, our public website uh, for COVID-19 related issues, and we are aggregating and posting um, the relief requests when they do come in, uh, we'll be posting them there, and so there'll be a bit of a one-stop shop um, uh, there on our public website to um, communicate to everyone uh, those requests. Uh, and so with that, I think that concludes the business portion of our meeting. And I'll turn it back over to Sarah, and we'll take some questions and comments from members of the public. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bruce and Mike. So now we're, um, we've finished the business portion of the meeting, so let's get started with public comments. So if you are on the phone and you want to comment over the phone, all you do is hit star one, and that will get you in line. Just make sure that you have unmuted your own personal phone when you press star one. And then some of you I've already been chatting with via the WebEx chat, so um, if you want to submit a question via the WebEx chat function, if you're logged into WebEx, you can go ahead and do that as well, and I'll, I'll read aloud your question or comment and allow the NRC staff or, or um, industry to respond to those questions. Um, so once again, to get to the chat, if you're not seeing those icons at the bottom of your screen, the bottom of your WebEx screen, all you do is kind of hover over your WebEx screen and, and click on the slides and that blue chat bubble icon should pop up at the bottom. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, we'll go back and forth between the WebEx and the phone. So Karen, can I check to see if we have anybody on the, on the phone waiting to ask a question or comment? Thank you, there are no questions in the queue at this time. All right, so star one, um, if you want to ask a question on the phone, press star one. I do have um, some folks asking for the ML number for the presentation link. I will post that again on the WebEx, so I'm gonna do that now. But if you're not on the WebEx and you need to get a copy of our slides, um, if you're familiar with using our Adams, the ML number is ML2016 G244. And you can also find our slides on the public meeting notice for today's public meeting. Um, if you can find that by going to the NRC's public meeting page, there is a link to the slides there. And you'll be able to download a PDF of the slides there. So Star One and Karen, just let us know if we have any any if any questions pop up. You can interrupt we me. Have, and we do have one question, Sarah. Thank you. Um, coming from Nina. Ma'am, your line is now open. Well, good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Well, good morning. I'm in San Diego, California, and of course, uh, representing one of the most dangerous and controversial issues in the country. And I, I've heard a lot of information this morning, greatly appreciated, about how the NRC is taking steps to adequately protect the industry participants. But I really just have to make a comment, really, not a question, that um, the insensitivity of the NRC to hold a public meeting at 6 a.m. on the West Coast it's just another demonstration about how you're overlooking the need for the participation of these workers at an ISPACY that's not generating essential electricity to stop work and be in compliance with the executive order of the governor of California. I mean, these workers are putting our communities in danger on a daily basis, there's been an outcry on the West Coast for this work to stop. And that you would hold a meeting at 6 a.m. when you know most of the public participation on the West Coast is asleep is just indicative of how insensitive the NRC is to actually doing anything. And that you'd hold a public meeting two months after and at 6 a.m., it just demonstrates too little, too late. 
Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Thank you for that comment. We appreciate the feedback on the timing, and we'll be sure to make sure that we consider that going forward. Karen, do we have any other comments on the phone? There are no further questions at this time. Okay. So folks, press star one. Um, Andrea, unless you wanted to um, chime in at all? Sure. Just um, just reiterate what I said at the beginning. We do apologize for the time of the meeting um, and our um, intent to, you know, speak publicly about the process for relief requests. Um, you know, we wanted to schedule the meeting just as soon as we can. We do apologize for the time. Uh, we'll definitely keep that um, in mind for later. And then as far as um, continuing operations at our ISFA you know, we're looking at ISFA across the country. Um, of course, state by state, are, they're making decisions on what businesses are essential and what are not essential. The NRC doesn't involve it, uh, get involved with those decisions. We are involved in whether these facilities can be operated safely. And so, as I said at the beginning and as John reiterated, we are communicating with our licensees on a continuous basis to monitor the safety of the facility, of, of these facilities, and any impact of COVID on the safety of the facilities. Uh, we haven't seen that there is an impact to date, um, but we're monitoring closely. And if we see that there is a problem or challenge, uh, we certainly will engage. Okay, I'm getting some questions um, in via the WebEx. So I do have one comment um, for the NRC team, um, a suggestion um, for you to consider repeating this meeting at a later date and a later time in the day to better accommodate West Coast stakeholders. So that's a comment for the NRC team to consider. Um, Karen, let me check on the phone really quickly before I start getting to the um, to the WebEx questions here. Do we have anybody else on the phone? Yes, thank you. We do have two questions. Thank you. Our first question is coming from Charles. So your line is now open. Hi, this is Charles Langley in San Diego. And my question is, really our concern is that we've got an ISFA out here that has many, many workers coming in involved in demolition and deconstruction. We've also got uh, ISFA workers moving and packaging nuclear waste. And it's not clear to me how many workers are actually going in and out of the San Onofre nuclear generating station on a daily basis. And the reason I ask that question is, is it, it's one thing if there's a, you know, a half dozen people moving in and out on a daily basis, or perhaps a thousand workers coming in and out that by their nature, I, I assume, maybe I'm wrong, that these are transient workers uh, that are often traveling great distances, but they're out in the community, and no matter how much they try to maintain social distancing, I would think it's it's rather difficult not to avoid a COVID-19 transmission on that site, especially in a heavy construction type of environment. And so the, the, the question is, is how many workers are at San Onofre on a daily basis how many are there in general, and what is the rate of infection at San Onofre, and how does that affect the surrounding communities? Thank you. Okay. Does anybody um, on this panel want to address that pretty site-specific question, which uh, maybe we can't specifically answer, but um, does anybody want to chime in? So I, if I could, this is uh, John McCurg and I, I will say that you know, I don't unfortunately have um, specific details on that site specific as to the number of workers that are moving in and out of the site at this time. Andrea already alluded to, um, you know, the NRC's focus is really on ensuring public health and safety. And as these um, movements are occurring, we want to ensure that they are done safely and in compliance with the NRC regulations. Uh, but I don't have the details on the number of workers, um, so I'm sorry I can't um, I can't assist with that. Uh, but we do know um, uh, we do have oversight 
on these activities, and we are seeking to ensure that they continue, if they do continue, that they're done safely and securely. And I'll just add to what um, John, John said. I think uh, several of us have mentioned that there's been um, continuous communication between the NRC and our licensees, and part of that communication that we're having is trying to understand um, what is happening at the sites as far as any impact of COVID on, again, operational safety. Uh, we haven't seen that to date. Um, uh, licensees are sharing, um, as they deem necessary with us, any um, incidences of the virus at their sites. Um, we're hearing a very few cases because of the actions that are being taken to limit spread of the virus. Again, we don't, we're not providing oversight of the spread of the virus, but we, we are interested in if, if the virus is impacting operations, and we're not seeing that on the NRC side. I didn't know if uh, any IRDPC wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, this is Bruce Montgomery. I just wanted to, to reiterate what you just said, Andrea, is that we're seeing very few cases, um, very isolated. I, I don't recall seeing anything happening out in Southern California that, that relates to or comes from uh, the operations being conducted out, either decommissioning or operation of the ISFSI. Okay, and that's, that's related to a question that we got via the chat, and the, the, uh, the person that asked kind of seemed to indicate that, you know, this was related to what we just discussed, but um, they asked, if the seat facilities don't seem to require close contact or people close together, like, for example, a control room for a reactor would, so what are the ISTC activities that require people to be close to one another? Yeah. Uh, this is John McCurgan again. I wanted to go back um, and, and try to tackle, I saw a number of those questions in the chat. And so certainly we haven't received any exemption requests to date for um, ISCCs on, on pool to pad movements uh, for fuel. Um, it, many of the um, licensees are, uh, they've reported to us that they are practicing social distancing where possible. Uh, there are some evolutions that, that require um, uh, uh, employees to come into reasonably close contact, but they are applying and trying to follow the CDC guidelines um, as we understand it. Again, the NRC doesn't, doesn't regulate those activities, but we do appreciate um, receiving those insights from the industry. Uh, so there are some um, uh, evolutions in those movements that require um, personnel to uh, be in relatively close proximity but uh, uh, the industry is trying to follow the guidelines on, on distancing and, and face masks and, and screening. Um, I, I hope that uh, is responsive to the question. Uh, was there another question in the chat too, Sarah, that I might have missed? Yeah, so an another question is, does the NRC have guidance at this point on how far out licensees should consider temporary relief? Um, through the end of the year, for example, 12 months out, et cetera? So if I could, uh, we have no specific guidance on, on how far out they should consider that. These are, are um, very case-specific and fact-specific um, uh, developments, and what we expect is that those um, uh, requests are temporary, that they should be as, as short as possible, and the licensee should explain what they're doing to get back into compliance. We also are, are acknowledging that when uh, industries uh, do reopen, the medical community uh, starts to take um, uh, wellness visits or, or routine physicals again, there may be a bit of a backlog, and so it may take some time for um, folks to get back into complete compliance. But what would we expect is um, the initial uh, exemption request should be as short as possible. If an extension is needed, then that uh, exemption request should be updated to reflect what actions have been taken to get back into compliance and what's still needed. And, and again, even that extension should be as short as possible, but there's no specific guidance on, on how long it should be uh, beyond uh, that, that it should be finite and, and, and short as possible. Okay, thank you, John. Um, okay, so Karen, I wanna check in on the phone. Uh, so press star one if you wanna make a comment on the phone. Did we, we had additional questions on the phone, right, Karen? That is correct. Our next question or comment comes from Carrie, and your line is now open. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hello? Was it K 
Terry? Are you there? You might need to make sure your phone is unmuted. I'm okay. Are you okay now? Yes, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, we, we might need to come back to Carrie. Um, Carrie, one more chance, one last chance. Give it a whirl, just start talking. Okay. I, I'm the chair of the uh, Fuel Storage Advisory Committee in Haddam, Connecticut, for Connecticut Yankee, uh, which has been uh, decommissioned. And I'm just wondering what type of exemptions could possibly be requested by um, by the power plant or decommissioned plant yeah okay so Carrie's asking what what some examples of exemptions that uh, facilities decommissioned plants could be asking for so I don't know who would want to handle that either Sarah, or this is John McCurgan. Uh, Sarah this is John McCurgan perhaps I'll, I'll um, um, respond to that and Andrea or others could, could chime in. Uh, we have uh, been maintaining a, a steady dialogue with industry. I think one of the most common themes that we've heard is uh, this um, feature that uh, many of the staff at the plants are required to have uh, physicals on a periodic basis. Uh, the medical core in, in some of these communities is quite busy with the, the COVID emergency or uh, in trying to follow CDC guidelines, they've tried to limit um, exposure and, and um, that has made it a little challenging for some of the sites to meet those requirements for routine physicals. And so that's probably one of the most common um, themes that we've heard. Now, many in the industry uh, did try to, uh, they saw this coming and they tried to be a little bit proactive and, and pull forward the schedules for some of their um, uh, staff as soon as they could. And, and try to mitigate the situation that way, and that was certainly very appropriate and prudent action on their part. Uh, others, it's very uh, case-specific. Some of these communities are, are relatively um, not densely populated, and the medical staff could be limited, and so they are uh, having some challenges. To date, we have not received any of those requests, but we have heard that, and uh, I think we're hearing even today that, that we might be getting some requests like that in the near future. But that's probably the most common um, uh, item that we've heard uh, from the industry. Sarah, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, John. Erin, do we have um, other callers on the phone? And if you could let me know how many are in line, that would be helpful for a timing perspective. Yes, thank you. We do have two question or comments in the queue at this time. Okay, let's let's take the next one then. All right, our next one goes for Diane. Your new one's now open. Hello, um, Diane DeRigo, Nuclear Information and Resource Service. I wanted to know if there are, um, uh, ex um, I don't know what you're calling them in, exemptions or uh, for uh, physical uh, physical protections at, at the site. Um, will there be public notice of that? Okay, so Diane, you're wondering, oops, sorry, go ahead, John, you got it? Oh, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, I'll take that, right. So uh, we are trying to uh, make it easy for the public to see what's going on. We've established a, a public web page um, on the NRC web page. There's a COVID-19 um, uh, link, and there is, a, uh, it's broken down by the different types of, of licensees, power reactors, uh, and there's a tab there for um, FCCs. We will be populating all of our, um, uh, all the requests that we receive, we'll be putting them there. And uh, when it comes to security matters, some of the issues may be redacted, but uh, virtually always uh, there is some um, publicly available uh, portion to that. Some of the details may be withheld for security reasons. Uh, but again, I'll say to date, we have not received any, any um, uh, requests yet um, for, um, those types of, of physical security um, related items. Uh, we did mention earlier that um, industry is anticipating the need for some relief from physicals and, and other things as I just mentioned, uh, but we'll post them on the public webpage uh, for everybody to see. I'll turn it back to you, Sarah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go to the next 
phone unless unless um, Andrea, did you have any kind of clarification that you wanted to jump in and make about any of the previous responses or questions? Uh, no, I don't, Sarah. You can go to the phone. Oh. Okay. All right, Karen, can we go to the next commenter, please? Yes, thank you. Our next commenter is Charles. So your line is not open. Greetings. This is Charles Langley. Um, I just wanted to make three comments uh, on regarding the safety. And, and first, I think it's really disingenuous to say that the NRC regulates nuclear safety and public safety, but does not regulate COVID-19. This is a public safety issue. Second, granting safety exemptions during a plague is the exact opposite of the objective of keeping the public safe. And third, not knowing how many workers are at an NRC-regulated site is simply inexcusable. I, it really begs the question, what are you regulating? I'm asking, is it 10 workers, 50 workers, 1,000 workers? The reason I ask is because each site is a potential locus of infection during a time when the nation is essentially on, on lockdown and quarantine. And if somebody could please answer that question as to how many workers are at a typical decommissioning site like San Onofre, I'd, I'd really appreciate a response instead of a vague answer of, I don't know. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Does anybody from the NRC, um, would they like to um, respond to Charles? Oh, Sarah, if I could, I just, I want to offer um, uh, just one observation on, on exemption. And one of the most important elements of, of the exemption process is uh, the section of the application that discusses how the licensee is, is planning to maintain and continue to assure public health and safety. Uh, and often when we see these exemption requests, they're asking for some specific type of relief. But the thing the staff focuses on is that justification, the rationale that the licensee must put forward as to what uh, comp compensatory measures they're taking, what, what mitigation they're putting in place to continue to ensure public health and safety. And that's, that's one of the most vital pieces of the exemption request that uh, the staff looks for in terms of making our evaluation. With respect to the number of workers uh, in, in decommissioning sites, it, it does vary um, greatly depending on uh, what stage of decommissioning they're in, uh, what actions are going on at any particular moment. I do appreciate the commenters uh, um, uh, that th this does uh, reflect a, um, um, a challenge with respect to maintaining uh, compliance with the CDC guidelines. Um, uh, and I, I do apologize that I don't happen to personally know uh, uh, how many workers are right like there. Um, Jack, this so is Bruce Watson. Can I, can I oh. chime in a little bit here? Please yes, do, Bruce. Bruce. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is Bruce Watson. I'm Chief of the Reactive Decommissioning Branch that oversees the activities, the overall activities, decommissioning activities at, at San Onofre. Uh, right now, there are a number of uh, essential activities going on at the site. Uh, they include the spent fuel moves and transfers and uh, the preparations work for shipping the reactor vessel off-site from Unit 1. Uh, the, the number of people on-site is around uh, a few hundred, um, and they're, they're all deemed uh, essential. Uh, they have a COVID-19 plan that Southern California Edison is using, uh, not only for all their contractors, but all site personnel. Uh, entering the site, uh, and that includes uh, temperature monitoring and, and, and a questionnaire uh, for the people to answer. Uh, for the individual tasks, there is a COVID-19 uh, uh, procedure they follow for ensuring that social distancing and other, other actions are taken uh, to ensure that the uh, workers uh, stay adequately uh, separated to do the work. Um, and of course, uh, this work is essential under the guidelines that your, your governor has provided in the state of California. So uh, today we've not had uh, any uh, COVID-19 issues that I know of at uh, San Onofre, and so the work is continuing on a limited basis, 
and uh, they have a, a very good monitoring program that's consistent with the, the CDC and, and uh, I'm sure your public health officials in California uh, to allow the work to continue. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Bruce. This is Andrea. I just want to circle back to uh, something we discussed earlier with regard to the NRC's involvement in COVID-19. I don't, I don't want anybody to walk away from this call thinking that the NRC is not acutely interested in the impact of COVID-19 on our facilities. Of course we are, um, and that's why we're having this public meeting um, and the dialogue. Um, no, we don't regulate COVID. We don't regulate um, the CDC actions that are being taken at sites. We rely on other federal agencies to set those standards. But what we do regulate is the safety of our facilities, and any impact of COVID on the safety of our facilities is what we're focused on. So I just want to make that um, really clear. And in terms of um, issuing exemptions at this time, and I think, um, you know, John um, mentioned this earlier, um, there are some requirements that are either very difficult or not possible to implement um, if you actually abide by the CDC guidelines and social distancing. And so, you know, based on the unprecedented nature of what's happening, uh, you know, we obviously have to balance the safety and security of workers as, uh, in regard to being exposed to the virus um, and the safety of the facility in terms of nuclear safety. Um, so that, that is what we're balancing here. Again, I'll go back to what I said and John reiterated. We would not approve an exemption unless we have the assurance that there are compensatory measures in place um, to assure safety at the facility, and that's our role. Um, and that's what we will be acutely focused on as we review any relief requests. Thanks, Sarah. Back okay. to you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. And just a reminder for folks to check out the, the chat panel if you're on the WebEx. Um, I have been posting some links. Um, for instance, you know, if, if the staff does start to get exemptions in, they'll be um, you're posting, putting some links up to those, um, you know, minus any security-related information, of course. I provided that link of where you can find those. And, and there's been none received to date, so you'll see it says there's none received to date, but maybe that will change. Um, let me check in with the phone. I want to do a time check. It's 5 after 10, 10 05, and um, you know, we do want to stay somewhat on time here. So let me do one last call for comments, star one over the phone, or submit something via the chat. Karen, is there anybody on the phone waiting to make a, ask a question or make a comment? Yes, Sarah, thank you. We do have a question or comment coming in from Rick. So your line is now open. Yeah, hi, this is Rick Gervais from NMSS, uh, NRC's Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards Office. And, but I, I, my uh, uh, the information I was going to provide has already been provided by uh, uh, Andrea and the gentleman from DUOP. No further comment. All right. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for calling in. Okay, Karen, do we have anybody else on the phone? Yeah, no further questions or comments at this time. Okay. All right, so with that, I think we are going to wrap up the public comment portion, um, and I want to hand it back to John McCurgan. Um, go to the next slide, please, Kelly, and we will um, close out. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everybody. Um, Really appreciate the, the dialogue and the Q's and A's. And um, if I could just uh, recap, uh, so the agency, you know, is preparing uh, for anticipated relief requests. We're having a good dialogue with industry to make sure we maintain an understanding of the situations at the site. And I want to ensure that they are ensured in public health and safety. If you do have additional questions, uh, we do have an email resource available. It's on the slide there. And uh, we will be producing a, a meeting summary uh, of this meeting today, and we'll get that posted. And if you do have feedback on the meeting, uh, please, uh, you, Sarah has offered her email, uh, or you could provide some comments back uh, to the contacts listed on the meeting summary. I want to thank everybody for their participation today, and um, please uh, stay safe and well uh, during these uh, very trying times. So thank you all very much. All right, with that, we'll, we'll conclude. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. This concludes today's conference email. I'll disconnect at this time.